Good evening. So no one has uh, withdrawal symptoms from not having a reading group tonight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a reading. Uh, this won't be a formal group per se, uh, but I think it's an important reading. And so over the next uh, day uh, before Christmas Eve, I'm going to be reading uh, chapter four of this book, Ann Belford Yulinoff's book, Wisdom of the Psyche. And so I'm going to read chapter four. I've copied it out of the book so I could mark it up. And um, it's this whole chapter is quite interesting, but it's also fairly long. So I'm going to go ahead. Hello, Andrew. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the chapter. The chapter. It's in three parts, and she's marked out three parts. So I'll read chapter or part one this evening, and then hopefully through tomorrow, I'll be able to read parts two and three in different sessions. And then finally, uh, in Christmas Eve, I will uh, be hopefully in my Santa hat uh, reading the night before Christmas. Let, let's see how that goes. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, so for now, I'm reading uh, from chapter four, part one of The Wisdom of the Psyche by Anne Belford Ulanoff. The Wisdom of the Psyche by Anne Belford Ulanoff. And this is chapter four. What follows is a view of how and where the psyche establishes its place in the religious scheme of things. Work with the psyche must go further than unshackling its resources for a fuller life. That unshackling is no small thing in itself, as all of us can testify who have suffered bondage uh, to compulsion and achieve release from it through psychological work. Whether our addiction fastens on a work schedule, a regimen of neatness, a bedtime ritual, a diet program, on drink, drugs, or se sexual obsession, we know the humiliation and degradation that accompanies such a slavish state of being. It is like living under totalitarian regimes, St. Paul's principalities and powers. We know, too, the sweeping gratitude that floods us when we are liberated from such bondage by a greater power. Even though we have worked at our psyche in painstaking, laborious ways, sometimes for many years, we know deep down in ourselves that the work, though necessary, was not sufficient. Liberation, when it comes, is a gift, something inexplicable that breaks in upon us. Though related to our work, it does not seem to be dependent on it nor to be caused by it. The relation of our human efforts to this inbreaking of releasing power remains mysterious, awesome. To say then that the psyche and psychoan psychoanalytical work can perform the work of unshackling us, freeing us to live what we have been given, is not to say something inconsequential. It is to say a great deal. But we must go further still to assert in ways of psychic life those things which are permanent and wise, to go beyond the dropping of the chains of the psyche to the taking up of the joys of the freedom of the spirit. Many of the insights given us in and through psyche point to that something in the human psyche which is lasting, where the psyche unmistakably reflects the spirit. In our collective life, where we work to transform collectivity into community, some of the spiritual character of the ego self life of individuals necessarily reproduces itself 
because the collective is made up of individuals, many of whom possess that spirituality of many of whom possess that spirituality at some stage of development. In fact, one of the necessary steps in transforming bunches of people, mere collectivities, into groups of people living in relation to each other as communities is precisely the recognition that we share as individuals the same kind of life, both of psyche and of spirit. We recognize self in other, the domain of spirit, and we experience its claims to which our own egos must respond, and for which sometimes we even must make sacrifices. The insistent strength of the psyche points to the spirit, not to be diminished by it, certainly not to be eclipsed by it, but that both may be enhanced in the meeting. My view differs here from others who tackle this problematic. This identification of the ground of psyche in religious scheme of things. Some who have thought about this want to explain away religion by translating it into psychological terms, entirely reducing the epistemology, the epistemology, <laughs> entirely reducing the epistemology of spirit to that of psyche. In doing so, they leave out the flesh of the matter, the concrete living of the spiritual life in terms of worship, community, rituals of prayer and service are subsumed in the language and process of psychological ritual. It is, sorry, it is a strong and tempting argument for those rituals are necessary, urgent indeed to all who take up, take their psyche's existence seriously, but they are not complete in themselves and never can be. To work with dreams, for example, to meditate on their meaning and try to fold that meaning into the heavy stuff of one's daily life is a process as delicate and decisive for the outcome of the whole as folding stiff aerated egg whites into a souffle. It is a task requiring practice, finesse, and luck. If it works, it develops in us the life of the spirit, our capacity to commune with the unseen. But it is not the same as, nor does it, nor does it even substitute for the most crude and tri the most crude and childish efforts to pray to the source of unseen reality, which is to say, the source of the psyche. Okay, now I have to apologize because I'm, I have a little bit of a cold, so. Good evening, Mama Lama. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to continue on with this reading. I'm reading from Chapter Four of The Wisdom of the Psyche by Anne Belford Ulanoff. The audacious work of religion is to try to establish personal relation to the center. The center is that which not only acknowledges our small selves, but loves and cherishes them. Wisdom is the product of a lasting sapientia. That's uh, sapientia means wisdom in Latin, not of an ephemeral scientia, science. Depth psychology concerns itself with scientia, the world of transitory things where we live so much of our lives, but that world cannot fill us for long unless it prepares us for and leads us to spiritual understanding, to the realm of sapientia. Analysis leads to, points toward, the transcendent. Failure to acknowledge that function is one strong reason analysis often fails to work and why analytical groups are so often full up with controversies and petty squabbles, even when they are very creative. I think, for example, of the British cycle, I think, for example, of the British Psychoanalytic Society, 
which fought for two decades over the merits of the theories of Melanie Klein and Anna Freud, while a middle group of analysts, people like D.W. Winnicott, Marion Milner, and Michael Ballant, grew up outside the quarrel, rich in its own creativity, alive in its own spirit. All analytical theories reach toward the transcendent, few explicit few explicitly acknowledge its existence, and even those usually do so hesitantly, nervously, hence the ultimate not pointed to, all but outlawed, falls into the unconscious, expressing itself in the fervor with which factions defend their theories, each time as if truth itself, ultimate truth, were at stake. Those who disagree are put to a stake of sorts, exiled to peripheral status, sometimes marked taboo, and what remains is endless haggling and haranguing. The failure to acknowledge explicitly the transcendent element in theories of the psyche inevitably leads to such fanaticism. It is, as we know too well, the same in the church though the virulence comes from the opposite end. There people do explicitly acknowledge the transcendent, but they easily skip over its impact on the psyche, its effect on our reception of the transcendent into our daily life. It does not get acknowledged all the way down into our unconscious lives, where it must find its place in our sexuality in our aggression, where it must find its place in our sexuality, in our aggression. So in the church too, people get stuck in the identifying of the ultimate with the pointers to it and new, fa and new fanaticisms spring up. At the end of the spectrum of theory about the role of the psyche in a religious view of things, where the psyche becomes all, it turns into a great dumping place, a lowest common denominator to which all religious expressions can be reduced. The result is a religiosity about matters psychological with an aggressive showing of intolerance, with holier-than-thou rhetoric, fanatic, zeal it fanatic zeal in support of the position and outright persecution of opponents we see here the danger of a young discipline depth psychology is barely a century old it is not only young it is often primitive in its attitude and procedures it contains both in its subject matter and its way of dealing with it a lot of crude raw life. It is an exciting world, even at its most raw, perhaps especially then, perhaps especially then. I'll read that sentence again. It is an exciting world, even at its most raw, perhaps especially then. When people get involved in it, they are gripped, fascinated, tempted to take parts for holes. It offers one of the most alluring of the utopian diversions. Everyone should be analyzed, then the world will become safe. All that is needed is to explode that theory is to become an analyst and survive in, in the field for 20 years or more, to go to analytical meetings and join with other analysts who have been analyzed and find oneself still caught up in fighting pettiness in inanities of empty discussion and procedural imbroglios, all mixed up at the same time with genuine research, deeply satisfying professional conversation, and the marvelous hard work involved in the search for better ways to understand and treat the human psyche. On the other side of this theoretical spectrum are the people who deeply interested in matters of psychological and religious, I'm sorry. Uh, this book is written by Ann Belford Ulanoff. 
and she writes, she's written a lot of very powerful books. This book is called uh, The Wisdom of the Psyche. Let me read the sentence again. I don't know, we have to find the beginning of it. Sometimes these psychologist sentences get out of control and you can't find the beginning. Okay. All, okay, so let's see. She's talking about the utopian diversions. Everyone should be analyzed when the world will, then the world will become safe. All that is needed is to explode that theory is to become an analyst and survive in the field for 20 years or more, to go to analytical meetings and join with other analysts who have been analyzed and find oneself still caught up in infighting, pettiness, in inanities of empty discussion and procedural imbroglios, deeply satisfying professional conversation and the marvelous hard work involved in the search for better ways to understand and treat the human psyche. On the other side of this theoretical spectrum are the people who are the people also deeply interested in matters psychological and religious who do the opposite, who collapse the psyche into the spirit, usually defined in the full detail of their own religious denomination. What they usually ignore completely is the actual existence of the unconscious, the fact of its existence and its particular life in each of us. It is thought all, it is thought all right here to investigate ethical metaphors, to identify and survey the metaphysical horizons of a given school of depth psychology. But the aim almost always is to restrict indeed to jump over the extraordinary life of the psyche, the world of the unconscious, not only in each of us as individuals, but among us in groups as well, in our collectivities and communities. What is ignored or misidentified is the force of psychic energy, which runs through our cultural, political, and economic systems. Sometimes these critics take a particularly sociological tone. Sometimes these critics take a particularly sociological tone, proclaiming that what is needed is social systems analysis, not psychoanalysis, to address all the many pressing problems of today's world. The question I always want to ask is, why the either or approach? Why not both and? Social systems analysis has its value, but it is no substitute for work with the psyche. One discipline cannot be collapsed into the other without both falling apart. A gap properly exists between them. Their differences inform and stimulate research, knowledge, dialogue, every sort of discovery of what lies below the surface of things. There can be a tyranny of mental health too. Depth psychology is no substitute for political action or social analysis, but I would argue strongly it must be included in those ventures. It is not yet included enough in social awareness nor in theological curriculums, but the balance tips more heavily toward doing social analysis, partly because depth psychology is still a young discipline, but mainly because people are afraid to acknowledge their own psyches. This means recognizing energies, impulses, fantasies, needs working in us and in all other in and in all our social dealings that we do not know about and do not control. That requires courage of the first order. A great a great deal of persistent, unobtrusive work on oneself that does not get headlines, but that changes the social situation from the inside out. The way the discovery of underground springs, waters, the way the discovery of underground springs waters and makes fertile the ground so that things grow. 
any effort to use analysis to avoid social issues and involvement fails, it will not work. The analysis will be fake. The self in its very essence is social and the work we do on ourselves will push us into social Congress. So going on, page 115. At this religious end of the spectrum, the tough, act, the tough facts of the psyche are skipped over. The rude confronting images our unconscious tosses up to us in nightly dreams, the brute energy of archetype and instinct that stands against good intentions and reasonable expectations all in aid of the construction of intellectual schemas showing how depth psychology goes with religion. But what a loss, the great impact of the lived psyche, the experience of the unconscious breaking in upon us, sometimes to bless, sometimes to wound. Dreams can terrify. A woman dripped that she came home to her apartment to find her front door bulging outward as if it was going to blow up. A fierce buzzing sound came from within my home. I knew that flies, bees, hornets were swarming there and I couldn't go in there anymore. Six months later, the dreamer was diagno diagnosed as suffering from a terminal malignant brain tumor. Dreams can also bless by putting us in touch with lost parts of ourselves newly found by touching us deeply with the sheer beauty of being, by putting before us a numinous scene. One woman dreamt that in cleaning out the attic closet, she had discovered a whole new room hiding inside it. There she found many treasures, an old diamond pin, a wooden relic of a saint, and all the old dollhouse furniture, a world of things priceless to her as a little girl. There was more, a big wolfish dog whom I pet. I feel its fur. Still another woman dreamt she was invited to be the guest at a large house in the middle of the city. In its big marble foyer near the outdoors are large open beds of peony flowers, hundreds of them, gorgeous pale pink roses and whites. I hear them opening in the dream. A fourth woman dreamt that she was traveling in a foreign land from her small hotel room on a stone cliff. She looked with her lover down on land. There is a great forest right at the center of town, a deep green one with high trees. Through the green, you look down into its dark interior. The center of town is a marketplace, old and spacious and full of activity of the people who live there. A river runs through the town center. In front of the forest is a huge ornately carved wooden facade, almost like a rude screen one sees before the altar in old churches. It is an awesome scene. It is as, it is as if everything comes together at the center, water and forest, human activity and nature and a symbol of the unseen mystery that authors it all. Instead of including such experience in one speculating at this end of the spectrum, people talk about the unconscious while avoiding the fact of it, its actual lived life. The result may be an interesting intellectual system, but such speculations function to deny and to defend against the reality of the psyche that is dangerous, just as dangerous as denying and avoiding the transcendent. More precisely, it is another way to avoid the transcendent as it speaks to us out of our depths through the things of which we are ordinarily unconscious. We might sum up the problems of these two opposing views of the relation of depth psychology to religion by saying, by saying to begin with that depth psychology, 
in its focus on subjective experience, does not ask explicitly where our experience of the transcendent points to something real and true that actually exists. As a result, the feeling for the transcendent must express itself negatively by an insistence on the correctness of one's theory or method of treatment or training procedures for new analysts, a creeping rigidity develops, one that belies the very one that belies the very spirit at the heart of depth psychology, a spirit that is, or at least can be, flexibly respectful of human oddities and foibles, that honors the unique in the general, wherever and however it appears. By failing to acknowledge the transcendent dimension explicitly by name, the flexible, respectful spirit stiffens. What follows is overemphasis on the general and ersatz tr transcendent principle. Ersatz means fate, by the way. And ersatz transcendent principle is articulated and in its own sorry way. It triumphs despite strong opposition. It issues forth in an increasingly didactic tone in the enunciation of theory. Thus we hear from Freud that all women suffer penis envy, period. All men suffer castration anxiety. All people go through precise and altogether nameable developmental stages. This last is a splendid way to inflict on fellow analysts, on trainees, on patients, on readers, a great sense of inferiority because one or another is invariably behind, stuck at an earlier stage. <clears throat> Having failed to complete one particular stage or to graduate to the next, one point in example comes from Jung's theories, the decisive experience of the self, that center of the whole psyche. It must always come in the image of a mandala, we are told. What if one never has had such an experience? Too bad, no self-experience there. Or as a patient of mine once said years ago, he was afraid with a previous analyst of not being good enough, of not being a good enough patient because he did not have quantities of big dreams, ones full of archetypal motifs but only brought his doctor little dreams about his daily life. I am not criticizing Freud and Jung here, but rather trying to point out our obvious human propensity to sin. When we turn away from the transcendent, it does not go away. It just reappears in disguised form. We are apt to make gods out of our theories. What then of the true transcendent? When will it come to us? How? Theology falls into the soup from the opposite side of the bowl. In its focus on the objective existence and nature of God, it leaves out the psyche's experiences of God, how the real affects us, what the psyche has to tell us in our conscious formulations about the fact and nature of God. It may fail then to make direct connection and the living word may become just words, lively symbols perhaps, but dead signs. That is terribly serious. One wonders at judgment day if teachers and preachers of religion will not hear the thundering question, why did you take something so alive, so burning with consuming holy fire and make it so dull, so dead? All <laughs> uh, right. And so, okay. Yes, thank you, Jerome, for pointing out who um, Ann Belford Ulanoff is. She's emerita professor at this point. Um, and um, 
this book was published in about 1986, so it's horribly buried in a great quantity of literature and needs to be pulled up. That's why I'm reading it tonight. <clears throat> We live in the psychological century, the 20th century she's talking about, <clears throat> where explorations of inner space probe as far as those that go into outer space. Theology and the church hopple themselves when they fail to recognize the broad, deep, rich life of the unconscious already there in, in religious symbol, ritual doctrine and sacrament. It is a failure to take seriously the transcendent in its persistent imminence in, a, uh, in and among us. Excuse me. Sorry, I'm fighting that pesky cold. <clears throat> and you'll be thankful that I turned off my mic before I sneezed. <laughs> uh, okay, going on. I'm going to go back for a minute and start reading at the beginning of this paragraph. We live in the psychological century where explorations of inner space probe as far as those that go into outer space. Theology and the church hobble themselves when they fail to recognize the broad, deep, rich life of the unconscious already there in religious ritual, symbol, doctrine, and sacrament. It is a failure to take seriously the transcendent in its persistent imminence in and among us. Within the system of the psyche, we experience unconscious contents as transcendent to our egos. But if we accept the fact of the unconscious as existing here with us, even if unconsciously, we reach to a sense of the transcendent that is beyond the whole psyche not just outside our egos. It does, however, make itself known through the psyche, indeed, in each of us, in each of its most intimate personal elements and experiences, both of personal and communal life. Our experiences of the transcendent are amazing as it crosses the old boundaries of outside and inside of the God up there and us down here, those ancient separations of transcendence and imminence understood for so long as conflicting opposites. To know them in direct experience is to know them interwoven with each other. The opposite of both is reductionism, whether that of the psychologist or the theologian or any other. Depth psychology at its worst reduces in an upward spiral to formulas and concepts that do not persuade us because they do not inherit in us. Theology's failure to take the unconscious seriously leaves the imminence of God unreceived, unincarnated. Consciousness of the psyche's reception of God is essential if we are to perform the ministry of the ego in housing all that we are given to be. To reduce depth psychology to intellectual concepts that can be mapped and ranked and then found wanting because they do not concur with our preordained theological concepts is really to run away, to evade the full big life that opens when one acknowledges the unconscious. What we, do this, what we do this way is to put the unconscious in a box and then quickly shut the lid. What, what would it mean not to fail? What, sorry. What would it mean not to fall into either of these polarized extremes? It would mean living with the gap between depth psychology and religion, 
not insisting that it be closed, but rather accepting that opening, but rather accepting that opening as a source of endless unfinishedness, knowing that one's theories will never finally close or cross the gap, understanding that the two disciplines will never entirely meet or agree. It would mean living with a radical openness to the transcendent that could overturn many of our theories, our theological symbols, our church programs, our prayer methods, our dream interpretations, to all of which we have become so deeply committed. The transcendent in its free entry into our lives could break in from above or below, overturning our psychological theories and our theological ones or extending or deepening them. We would be living consciously now with a keen sense of our dependence on the unconscious and the unknown, accepting the fact that we know a lot, but recognizing too how much we do not know and can never know. <clears throat> when at the beginning of this book, I said that depth psychology brings a new hermeneutic to theology, I meant just this sort of new attitude, at least, as much as I did the interpretive device of inquiring into the psychological meaning of religious doctrine, symbol, and text. The new attitude is central as it involves consciously making room for the unconscious in all our treatments of God. It carries with it a bolder, a more conscious facing of the fact that in all theological formulations, we speak as if what we say there were true. We never know for certain. Every, does that sound familiar? It's Jordan Peterson's favorite comment with respect to God. So I'll go back and reread that sentence. It carries with it a bolder, a more conscious facing of of the fact that in all our theological formulations, we speak as if what we say were true. We never know for certain. certain. Every certainty is colored by our subjectivity and our psychological experience of the spirit, large or small. Consciously acknowledging that means always waiting in the midst of speaking and acting, attending to what the other side may say or do to announce itself. At the same time, dogma, doctrine, and the symbols of tradition remain the shorelines to which we can hold in our acts of expectancy. We neither ignore the unconscious nor deify it. We accept its existence right there in the midst of what we take in consciously. In our acceptance of the unconscious and through the unconscious itself comes images and effects clues and reverberations of the other side that complement, correct, and confound our conscious images. We come with whatever certainty to the other side. We learn to heed the images of God that live in us. If we hold on long enough in the work of playing with those unconscious images alongside our conscious ones, and all of the next and all of them next to the images of God given in scripture and tradition, then we may even find ourselves moved by grace to reach beyond every human source to the unknown source itself. Psychologically, this inversion of consciousness feels like reaching through and beyond the inner gods of superego and ego ideal through the particular archetypes that run through our own lives, to gather together every possible strand of the central indefinable self that we know how, that we know now as our core of being. And what have we reached? What but the great vast dark unknown mystery that belies all our fixed categories of thought and our confident sense of apprehending it. Our knowing has been transformed into an unknowing, an eager longing that changes everything about us, makes us a new shape and size at the core. 
No longer do ideas or symbols or specific images mediate the divine to us. We enter the precincts of immediate knowledge where our own poor selves are the means through which we experience the imminent transcendent God. Okay, so that was part one of chapter four of the wisdom of the psyche. And I think that this is particularly interesting because it highlights the fact of the difference between uh, the logos and the eros. Uh, Jordan Peterson wants to be entirely on the logos. He says as his mantra that he wants to rescue uh, the logos, so-called, as if we don't have sufficient logos in our society. But the point is that psychology is a science and it seeks to quantify, statisticalize everything whereas theology is something else again. It's not necessarily science, and it is on the Eros side of the equation. And so theological experiences, experiences of God, of the transcendent, come uh, on the Eros side. This is the standard duality that we've been talking about for several years now. And so I think that Dr. Ulanoff has clearly delineated what the issue is, which is that psychology is on one end of the spectrum, the logos end, and theology is on the eros end of the spectrum. And uh, never the twain shall meet, but they can meet within us and they can have a meaning uh, within us. So that's my observation on this part of this reading. I'll read part two, hopefully tomorrow in the morning and perhaps part three in the afternoon. Uh, I do have, um, I do have a aspiration to read the night before Christmas tomorrow night, but uh, we'll see if I get to that. Uh, so let's see. I'm not going to read things that are conversation. Um, and Nick asks, uh, wondering how I'd compare the CIIS versus the Pacifica Institute. Uh, I don't know enough about CIIS to make such a comparison. I apologize for that. Um, Pacifica does uh, have uh, a, a curriculum that's heavily union involved, uh, although it's not technically, I don't think, a union institute per se, but it certainly uses the ideas of archetype and mythology. Uh, I don't know what CIIS even is, so I can't say. Um, yeah, Jerome makes a good point, a pointer back to something she said, which is not either or, but both and. So we need, we need uh, a spectrum of understanding ourselves plus uh, theology and keeping in mind, as I said in my uh, Finding the Living God, talk a few weeks ago, which you can find on this channel, um, that we, we need to be able to articulate between the two, between Logos and Eros, um, or the, the psyche and the physis, as Dr. Jung said. And as Dr. Jung said explicitly in answer to Job, Paragraph 752, every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world. So all this argumentation about whether the Bible is true uh, is 
sort of silly as it's presented by fundamentalists because yes, the Bible is true. It's 100% true in the psyche. It's not necessarily true in the physical world. Uh, certain aspects of it are certainly historical, but, um, but other aspects of it are not. And they are religious and, and many of the major things that happen in the Bible are either dreams or visions. So those are uh, psyche actions, not uh, physical hard evidence actions. Um, and Mama says, is the, that core of being the same as the center she mentioned earlier? I think, well, I think she's referring uh, to the self uh, here, which is Dr. Jung's um, end of the spectrum that he talked about throughout his life. And Tia's psychology is in logos end of the spectrum, theology on the Eros side of the spectrum. Uh, this sounds like anima animus. Well, anima animus are uh, in the in psychology. They're not in that same spectrum that you're talking about, Tio. There are so many dualities in the world. We have to try to remember uh, which ones we're talking about. So anima and animus are uh, psychological concepts from Dr. Jung, and therefore they're in the psychology end of the spectrum. Um, and uh, so anyway, okay. Uh, so I've given you a little um, quick pressy on this chapter, there's still two more parts to this chapter, and I will do my best to read them both before Christmas. And uh, so I hope to see you again tomorrow. And I don't know what I'm going to be reading tomorrow, so you can watch for it. Um, I won't be reading late because of course it's Christmas Eve, so I'll try to do one reading in the morning, probably around 10 or 11, and the second one in the afternoon, uh, maybe after I've gotten my Christmas haircut, <laughs> if I get one, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, peace. I hope you're all enjoying your Christmas season. Goodbye. Okay,